term HTML before, you might have heard the term CSS. We're going to be looking at one component uh, and trying to see like how we can use it uh, to the to the best of our ability to make some really interesting things. And so here I've written on the slide, learn CSS with Grid and Flexbox. And those are just two extensions to the CSS language. But we'll take a look at that as we get there. All right. So by the way, if you don't have any of these slides, I'm, well, I think this, Antonio, this was in the email that you sent, but just in case, yeah. I'll put it in the chat as well. Great. Um, awesome. So now the goals for today. Uh, I'm making a few assumptions. So one is that maybe some of you, as evidenced by like the hand raising, have seen HTML and CSS before. So you might know some of the basics. Some of you may not know anything at all, which is totally fine. But luckily, we only need to learn a really small amount of HTML to get productive with it. So that's the first thing we're going to do. Second, we're going to be looking at just some of the basic CSS, so like how you can style things and what things like classes are, what paddings and margins are. But then we'll get to the meat of everything, which is Flexbox and Grid, these two extensions that I mentioned that let you pretty much build any layout you like. Fourth, we're going to look at this special CSS library called Tailwind. If you've heard of things like Bootstrap before or Foundation before, Tailwind is like very similar to that. It's a recent entrant into the CSS world, but it lets you make layouts really quickly. So it's a very productive CSS library. And we'll take a look at that as well. And then once we have all those four basic things in our toolbox, we'll move on and try to recreate some of Slack's interface. And just to give like a sneak peek at what that looks like, this was done in about a weekend. Um, and this is just using some basic CSS, Flexbox, Grid, and some of the like utilities that Tailwind, the Tailwind library provides. And I'm not entirely sure we're going to be able to completely recreate this interface um, where we're going to get close. We're going to at least lay down the groundwork for it. We're going to do it. We're going to do it. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to try and get all of it done. Uh, yeah. Uh, if you haven't used Slack before, let me pull it up. It's, uh, I mean, not to be condescending about like if people know what Slack is, but just in case you don't, it's a uh, a chat application that people use to work in teams together. This is what it looks like in real life. And this is hopefully going to be our recreation of it. Uh, this is the dark mode version. All right, so uh, questions are encouraged at any point. Like Antonio mentioned, feel free to put stuff in the chat, raise your hand, and we'll do our best. Yeah. Uh, before I move on, do we have any questions right now? So these are some important links. The slides I already put in the chat. I'll also put the link to the code editor just in case someone doesn't have it. And this is what we're going to be using to write most of our code. So you don't need to install anything. It's just a code editor on, in a web browser. You don't need an account for it, but when you do start writing code in Code Sandbox and you want to save it, then you'll need an account. But the account the accounts are free. You just need a GitHub account, which is also free to sign up for it. Um, if that's something. Yeah. Like. Yeah. So if you go to Code Sandbox, uh, I'm currently signed in, but it'll just say sign in, and then you can just sign in with GitHub. By the way, is everyone able to see both tabs? Screen visible. Are you able to see codesandbox.io at the moment? Yeah, we can see code, uh, code Sandbox and the, the slides tab. We can't see both the slides and the, now I can see the slides. Oh, perfect. Yeah, yeah. I'm just switching. I'm perfect. just switching between them. Yeah, I don't have a good layout system. No worries. All right. All right, so now let's move on to talking about first, like why we'd even want to build something like Slack in CSS. And so it actually turns out that many apps are built with just web technologies. So Slack, for instance, looks like a desktop app that runs on your Mac or Windows laptop. But in reality, this interface is just created with that basic HTML, CSS, obviously with many extensions to it, but bare bones, just that. So HTML and CSS that you create what the application looks like. The interactivity comes from elsewhere. So that comes from like backend code or like front end JavaScript. But that's beyond the scope of this workshop, but what it looks like, yeah, that's just HTML and CSS. And it's not just Slack, it's also Skype. It's also Notion, a note-taking app, Discord for chat, uh, WhatsApp for also for communication. And so a bunch of these applications that we use every day are created using HTML and CSS and a bunch of other web tech. Web, web tech. Um, 
So can, I guess now would be a good time. Can anyone figure out like what are some of the similarities between some of these interfaces that we've seen? Is there anything similar that pops out to you? Feel free to shout out or put it in the chat. Do you have like a list of contacts on the left column and then chat in the middle and then maybe some more features on the right column? Yeah, absolutely. That's right. Uh, who said that? Jonathan. <laughs> oh, awesome. Yeah, thank you for that. And Rosie also mentions in the chat that the screen is split into several parts and that's perfectly right. So you'll notice that most of these like have pretty common sort of metaphors that they use. They have like a sidebar on the left, they have a content area on the right, they have a header, header area. Some of them are three pane layouts, some of them are two pane layouts. But yeah, exactly right that the layout is similar. And uh, it turns out that CSS and HTML actually have certain features that make it pretty easy to accomplish these common use cases. And we'll take a look at that later as well. Vertical scrolling is another one. There's a special CSS property that we look at that makes that kind of scrolling possible. Yeah, thank you for that. So the takeaways are that CSS is good for application user interfaces, not just for web design or like making a portfolio website, but for actually creating software that people use. And there's certain common use cases and there are ways to achieve them. And it's actually more beginner friendly than some of the other ways to create software. So if you've ever heard of Qt or GTK, it's a bit easier than that. Uh, you can get started pretty immediately without installing something uh, and arguably easier than Swift UI or the thing that people use to make Android apps. But that's not to say that this won't come without repetition and practice. Uh, writing CSS can be fairly frustrating, but it, you just need to like keep doing it in order to get better at it. Uh, because CSS can be annoying. And here's a, some of the conversations between my friends who've already written some CSS before and they can testify to like how annoying it can be. Uh, so this is Felicia and like Michael talking about like how HTML, CSS and JS are pretty integrated technologies. And uh, yeah, like you do a lot of work and you see that there's little like end result. And that's just basically something you have to contend with when writing it. Um, similarly, there are a number of ways to do one particular thing. So these, these here are like CSS properties. Uh, we're gonna take a look at the syntax more, but these are things that style elements on the page. And these are five ways to hide an element. So one way is that you can set its display property to none, or you can set its visibility, which is another property to hidden. I still am not fully clear on what the difference is between those two, right? It's just like one use case warrants another and you do a quick Google. Uh, another way is to just like make the element go way off to the left of the page, or you can make it infinitely small or you can make it completely transparent, right? So there are five ways to do the same thing. And which way is the right way just like depends on a lot of Googling, right? That's one thing you'll find often with these like weird layout bugs and these CSS bugs that you have to go to Stack Overflow or Google to figure out how to do things. And that's completely fine. That's the best way to learn. I thought we'd look at some other memes. CSS can kill you. So there's a lot at stake. If you get your margins or your paddings uh, wrong or you get your like weird layout bugs and yeah, you can end up out of a plane or you're making a portfolio website for yourself and then everything just gets messed up. And then you have to like redo the change that you're doing. Yeah. And so why do these issues occur? Because CSS is an old language, basically dates back to the first, like one of, one of the first web browsers and there are new features being added all the time, including grid and flexbox that we're going to talk about. So there are many ways to do the same thing. But then there, there are two other issues. One is that like, when you're making a web application, you have to make sure that like it supports multiple different browsers. So Slack runs on your Chrome web browser as well. But at the same time, they have a desktop app um, and it needs to run, it needs to have like widespread support. So that's why CSS gets a bit unwieldy at times. And then the other thing is that you have to make these websites typically responsive for all devices. And what responsive means is basically as you shrink the page, it needs to adjust its size. And so that also adds to the complexity. Cool, so now that I've given, but that's not to say that CSS is hard or like inapproach, like unapproachable. We're gonna be looking at CSS in detail and you'll figure out that it's like, once you have like a some, somewhat nice understanding of it, it's not a pain at all to write. 
before I move on, uh, anyone have any questions? Awesome. So now we're going to look at the basics. And here we're going to cover a couple of things. First, we're going to look at how to write some basic HTML. And I'm going to be moving a bit quickly through this with the assumption that one, we don't really need to know a lot. And two, like maybe some people have seen this before, but then we'll get down into the meat of it, which is like how CSS interacts with HTML to create like web content, styled web content. Cool. So the first thing I want to talk about is like, what is H HTML? Uh, I mean, I dislike spelling out the abbreviation because it adds zero value. HTML is hypertext markup language, but we don't really need to care about that. Let's just call it the language for a web page. Um, and so each web page is actually a tree of these HTML tags. Uh, and what are tags? Tags are things like head, title, body, header, like image, paragraph. There are a bunch of these tags out there. The best way to see like the composition of his HTML page is actually to pull up someone's website and then start looking at it or like dissecting it. Um, what's a good one? Antonio, do you have a website that you would suggest? We're doing what, sorry? Oh, we're gonna inter like dissect the website. I'll just pull up oh, Felicia's. Sure. All right, so yeah. here, like if you like click inspect and uh, just right click the page, click inspect. That'll open up your console and, or like your developer tools. And we're not concerned about anything here. We can just like ignore everything, the console sources, et cetera. We just need to look at the elements. And here's where you start seeing some of those like tags that I mentioned. So you have like these divs, you have these headers, um, you have like a head and a body. And you can see that tags can be nested within other tags. And that's where this term of like HTML tree comes from. You start from like your outside div uh, or like your outside tag, and then you start putting stuff inside it and you start putting stuff inside that. So for instance, you'll have a body tag, which is like the content of your page. And inside of that, you'll start putting other things. Like you'll put like a heading or like a logo. Uh, then you'll start putting like a small description. Uh, and then you'll start working your way inwards, creating like sub headlines, uh, subheadings, images, things like that. So the best way to get somewhat familiar with how HTML gets structured is by just opening up your favorite website and just looking through the HTML there. Any questions about this? Raise your hand or do the reaction if you're able to go to a, a website, right click and inspect. Sam, can you show them how to select a specific element and how to have it highlighted in the inspector? Yeah, of course. So say like I'm interested in this element in particular, uh, this sub headline, um, sorry, this headline. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna click this, this icon thing, uh, which says select an element in the page to inspect it. It's the first icon here in your developer tools. You're gonna click that and then you're gonna select the element you're interested in, right? And then it's gonna highlight it here in the inspector. This is what it is. And you can open that up and you can see like, here's where the, where the text is and here's what it looks like on the page. And you can play around with it in the developer tools directly. If you wanna edit it, go for it. Right, you can just edit it here. That looks better. <laughs> Sorry, Felicia. Yeah, missing with Felicia. Um, Okay, let's go back. So yeah, that's what, I, that's what I mean when I say HTML tree, right? They're like, there's a tree of nodes, a head node, title, or like also called tags, body tag, uh, image, paragraph, et cetera. And that's how you basically start creating your first website or your first HTML document. So I guess it would be, interest, like, it would be instructive to do that ourselves right now. Uh, let's go to Code Sandbox. Let's click Create Sandbox. And then just use static. So you might have to scroll down a bit, but just click static. You don't, you can ignore everything else on the page. So I'm gonna click static now. Awesome. So what will happen is this code editor is going to open up in front of you. And 
when you first look at it, it might be like a bit intimidating to see all this stuff, but you can just hide some aspects of it, which we don't need. So for instance, you can click this Explorer icon and just hide the file explorer. We don't need to look, we don't need to be concerned about that. And so what you'll see on the left side is your code editor and on the right side, you'll see the preview. Any changes you make in the code editor will be updated in the preview. Hey, so for instance, uh, so I'm, yeah. Uh, can we get just like a thumbs up from people in the uh, Zoom call if you were able to get into the sandbox? Awesome, awesome. All right, let's keep going. Uh, that was like a, a big step because I just want to make yeah. sure. Right, awesome. Yeah. Awesome, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so now that people have got this open, uh, they can start editing stuff. And let's try and edit this stuff inside the body. Um, so here, body is where most of the content of your web page lives. H1 means like a header of size one. So we can try to edit the text in between here, like. Right, and then it'll show up on the page. As soon as you save, it should update. And if there's an H1, then yeah, there's also an H2, uh, as you might guess. And that's a header of size two, which is a smaller size. And you can keep going. It goes up all the way to the H6. Yeah. But H's aren't the only thing that is available in HTML. And this is gonna be a pretty big, like, uh, pretty generalized and quick run through of HTML because we're more interested in the CSS. So I'll just give you like a couple of other examples. You've got headers, but then you've also got paragraphs and that's just for writing like long text. Um, I don't want to write out a paragraph. So one thing you can do is just ri start writing lorem, which is an abbreviation for uh, placeholder text. And once you've got lorem written, just press tab and it'll autofill to give you uh, like a big text paragraph. Incidentally, this is how web designers like quickly lay out content by having this placeholder text come up. Thumbs up if you've been able to do this so far. Or raise hand. Awesome. Um, all right, let's keep going. The thing that we need to be, mo the most important HTML tag for our purposes for layouting is div. What, is, what does div mean? It, it really doesn't mean anything. It's just like this HTML tag that's used for pretty much everything. You can use it for text, but you can also use it to contain other elements like paragraphs. Um, you can have divs within divs. And that's also totally fine. That's pretty much 90% of the HTML we need. Antonio put this great link in the chat for more HTML basics where you can see what the other tags are for. Like one of the other, I mean, I'll give this a, a small, I'll give this like a very brief account. Like there's an image tag. We don't really need to use this right now, but it's like another one of the basic building blocks. And that lets you insert images in your code. And so what you can do is you can go to like Google images and you can search for like, maybe like a cat and this one. And then you could just copy its image address. Let's see how that looks. I'll put it in the chat as well in case anyone wants to use it. And you can go back to your sandbox and go to source and just give the URL as the source and you'll get this image in your preview. Sounds good. So headers, paragraphs, divs, and maybe images. These are just the basic tags we need to use. We're not really concerned with many others. And if the others do come up, then I'll let you know. All right, let's keep going. Let me put in a header and let me put in a paragraph for later. Let's go back to the slides. So there's this HTML tree. Okay. Each website has its own and there are a bunch of tags in your HTML, right? So now um, we're going to start looking at CSS. So um, 
yeah, so now we're basically going to start looking at CSS and CSS is a way that we can start styling these elements, right? So if you think of HTML, if you think of like the fact that you're building a house, a website is a house, then HTML is the bricks you put down, just the basic structure. And CSS is the paint you put on the bricks. So the way the house looks, the paint job you give it. And that's basically what we're going to do here. Right. So what we can start doing is start writing our first CSS using something called inline styles. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to put in a style attribute for my H1 tag. And then within quotes, I can start writing CSS. So you might have like, you saw some of the syntax from before, but it's as simple as a key value pair. So the key is color and the value is for instance, like red. And so our header becomes red. Right. And you can have multiple things here. So uh, there are a bunch of other CSS properties and I don't know all of them and you probably won't like know them like until maybe you've written quite a bit of CSS. So the best thing to do again is just Google based on what you want to do. For instance, I want to transform this header to be all uppercase. I'm too lazy to actually go ahead and write it myself. Right. But I want the CSS to do it for me. So what I can do is just use another CSS property. In this case, text transform. And then the value in this case is up for what I want to do is uppercase. And how I know that is I looked it up in advance. Right. So you can see that you can add, you can string CSS properties together and you can make your uh, HTML look the way you want it to look. Anyone been able to write their CSS? Raise hand or thumbs up. Amazing. All right, I mentioned here that there's inheritance down the tree of HTML. What does that mean? Let me remove the style attribute. Um, and instead of adding the style to the H1, say I want both the H1 and the paragraph to be the red color, right? I don't want to repeat myself. One thing I could do is just like, Write it twice. Right, and yeah, they're both gonna be right now, but I don't wanna write it twice. Uh, programmers don't like to repeat themselves. So what you're gonna do instead is try to go up the tree. Like you can tell by the nesting that there's a tree of HTML elements with the body as the parent and the children are H1 and P. So what you can just do is attach the styling to the parent and it will apply to its children down the tree. And now both of them are red, right? So this is what I mean by inheritance. You have a parent, just stick its style onto the parent and all his children will get it, right? If I do text transform uppercase here, its children will get it too. Any questions? Awesome. And if you don't have questions now, yeah, feel free to put it in the chat. Antonio is doing an awesome job just answering questions as well. Um, all right. So we've talked about inline styles and we've talked about inheritance down the tree, right? There's a last thing I want to cover before we start going down pretty much like start wrapping up the basics, which is classes. These are also super important. Classes are another way to promote reuse of CSS code. And the way you can start writing classes, is by having a style tag in your head. So your head is right here between lines three and nine. And you can put a style tag in here. I'm writing mine on line eight, but you could write it elsewhere as long as it's between head. And the way you declare a class, so it's, it's always better to show what a class is doing first before I even try to attempt to explain it. Uh, and then you'll kind of see that it becomes clearer. So the way you declare a class is with like a dot and then the name of your class. And it could be literally anything in the world. So uh, I'm just gonna call it like uh, Sarim, right? And then I can write my CSS code here. So instead of writing it in line within those quotes, I'm just deciding to write it here. But right now the web page isn't doing anything. The header and paragraph are still black, but that's because we haven't applied this class to the elements that we wanna apply it to, right? So 
How can I apply it? I just use the class attribute this time and in quotes, write the name of the class without the period this time. So when you're first de declaring the class, you write it with dot. But when you attach it to a tag with the class attribute, you write it without the dot within uh, the quotes. And then you click save. So now we've got the class applied to the header. So the H1, just like imagine you're a web browser and looking through this code, that's the best way to interpret most code. The web browser hits line 15. It sees the H1 tag. It sees, oh, there's a class attached to it. Its name is Sarim. What's the Sarim class? It jumps up to line eight and it sees that the Sarim class says to, to put the red color onto this element. And yeah, that's what it does. And you can start applying this class everywhere if you want. Thank you for that question, Shares. Yeah, indentation does not matter in HTML and CSS. So it's not like something like Python where if you don't indent, it like freak out. But indentation matters for your own like perception of the code. So you can quickly jump, yeah? So short answer to your question, no. But long answer, it's yes, it's good code quality to have everything indented. And luckily this web browser does that for you, this code editor. Any other questions? Cool, let's keep going. And I might be rushing through this a bit, but just because I wanna get through the basics quickly so that we can get to the fun stuff. Uh, now, one of the fundamental concepts in CSS is this idea of the box model. And this helps, I think it's not totally related to like creating the Slack, like Slack's interface. We could get by with, with me just telling you what padding and margin is, but I think it helps explain some of the difference between these similar concepts. Any HTML tag occupies some sort of space. So it has a width and a height. And inside of that tag goes content. So for instance, if you jump back here, there's this paragraph tag, for instance, and it's got a width and a height, and it's got some content inside of it. Same goes for this H1 tag. And um, not only does it have content, but it also has some white space around it. And that white space can be a mix of the margin and the padding. But the only way to tell like which white space is what is by knowing what the border of the element is, its bounding box. So let's do that. Let's write some CSS to make the border of this element visible. Currently it's invisible, but we can make it visible. So I wanna attach a border. There's a special CSS property for that called border, right? You can make it specific like border bottom or like border top, border right, etc. But we just want the border everywhere. And there's a bit of like syntax for it again, which I only know because I Googled in advance. Um, first, how many pixels thick you want that border to be? I just want it to be one pixel. I could make it five pixels, it'd be really fat, but I just wanted one, which incidentally is the smallest pixel value you're allowed to have. Then the style of the border, as in, do I want it to be solid, dotted, dashed? I just want it to be solid, like one continuous line. And then the color of the border. So maybe let's do brown and then click save. So now we have the borders coming around these elements. Um, you've got one around the header and you've got one around uh, the paragraph. And now you're able to sort of see like the, the effect of the padding and the margins that we're gonna cover now. So if I add padding, like maybe 10, 10 pixels worth of padding, you're gonna see that the white space is added internally, which means there's white space added between the border and the content of the element. But if I add margin instead of padding, like 10 pixels worth of margin, then that margin is actually existing outside of the border. It's between the elements now. So let's exaggerate this difference with 50. It's more visible. Right, or we can do padding again. Yeah. So padding adds white space internally, margin adds white space externally. And you wouldn't know it just by looking at some HTML, right? I've hidden the border, now you don't know. Uh, an outsider doesn't know. But by adding the border back in, we can get an idea. So any questions about the box model, uh, padding, margins, borders? I have a question about the color. 
<clears throat> so you you write the color red on top of the uh, on the very top. So is it gonna change all the colors of the text, or if it is gonna change like every color into red? That's a good question. Uh, color in this case means text color. Yes, you're right. Uh, there's other types of colors that you can attach. So the border has its own color, but that's just, I mean, I could write it, I could like make it explicit with the border color property, right? So you can just write a shorthand where you have the color. I think what you might be more interested in is background color. So let me write green this time. So that's another type of color. Usually color, which is for text, and background color, which is for everything outside of that element uh, between its border uh, and basically like everything inside the border of the element, the background color. Those two colors are the most important in CSS. That's 99% of your use cases. Color for text and background color. Okay, cool, thank you. No problem. Any other questions? By the way, uh, there are other ways to represent colors as well. So if you hover over this, it'll give you this color picker, which is really cool. And you can write your colors in RGB. If any of you have used like Illustrator or like Photoshop or something before, then yeah, that's one way you can add colors. You can also adjust the opacity of something. So if you recall like that meme I showed where you can hide something by setting its color to be like zero opacity. So yeah, you can do that here. Let me bring that back up. Great, so let's keep going. Okay, the other foundational concept in CSS. There's certain elements which are block elements and there's certain elements which are inline elements. I think this graphic explains really, ooh, this graphic explains really well. We will look at an interactive example as well. So a block element basically takes up 100% of the width that's loaded to it. It's like a selfish element. It doesn't let anyone share space next to it. Uh, if there's someone, along its line, the, its horizontal line, it just kicks that other element down to its own line. So in this case, the green element is being a selfish block element and it's telling the pink one to basically like find its own horizontal line. However, if the green element and the pink element were inline elements, then they would try to take up as much space as they need and only as much as they need and basically share the horizontal line with each other, right? So here the image description says, block elements stack regardless of their width and inline elements flow, flow from one line to the next, right? Now, this is gonna be pretty important when we look at Flexbox. So let's try something. Uh, let me remove the padding here. Let me keep the borders. So the H1 and the paragraph, they don't have any explicit width set. By the way, width is another property. So I can do width here and maybe make it like 50 pixels or so, right? And so, yeah. I've set, I've manually set a width, which may or may, like the width doesn't know anything about the content. Uh, so sometimes setting the width can be risky. But if we set no width, then the elements take up as much content as they need, but also if they're block elements, they take up 100% of the width of their horizontal line. So in this case, both the H1 and the paragraph are uh, block elements. Um, but say we don't want them to be like selfish block elements, what can we do? What we can do is just set the display property to be inline, right? Display is another CSS property and we can set it to be inline. And suddenly you see that they like share space, right? So they're hundred percent width before and they're selfishly taking up the entire width, but now they're sharing space and stacking next to each other neatly. So any questions about display inline versus block? Awesome. Uh, by the way, when we had header and paragraph on their own, the fact that they were display block was implicit, but we can make it explicit as well by just writing display block, right? So many CSS properties are set to some default and it's not always clear what those defaults are and that can be annoying, but uh, you just need to Google. Uh, let me give you an example of a tag, which we're not gonna use, but which is inline by default. So if I just write, there's a span tag and I can write like some random text here, right? 
And now notice I write another span tag and write some text here. And the spans stack, right? This span stack neatly with the other span. Okay, so let's keep going. Now we get to the nice part, the flex, like Flexbox and Grid, two ways that you can start creating really nice layouts in CSS. Um, okay, the biggest problem with CSS is for first, like first time CSS writers to figure out, oh, how do I center stuff? How do I align stuff vertically and horizontally, right? There's this funny meme that I forgot to include, which is like someone writing in 2017, what technology still doesn't exist today? And the like, top rated answer was, oh, we still haven't figured out a way to align stuff both horizontally and send like vertically in CSS. Thankfully, this was before like Flexbox gained mainstream popularity. Now we thankfully do have a way to do this. All right, so I already talked about some display properties, right? So I talked about like display in line here, right? Which uh, puts stuff next to each other. There's also other display properties like flex and grid. Uh, we have a question. Can we use code sandbox to make a free website? Do we have to pay to change the URL? That's a good question. Uh, this URL that you see uh, is temporary. Um, I don't think that it can exist for, I mean, I sent one to Antonio earlier to show him like the Slack interface and it timed out after a while. So I'm not entirely certain, but we, since this is a code editor, what you can do is uh, click deployment and it'll make it very easy to deploy to the service called Netlify. And Rosie mentions you can easily host a website through GitHub and she's also totally right. You can just download this code and put it on GitHub pages and you have a website that way. Cool. Um, so yeah, getting back to uh, display properties, we already talked about inline, but there's also flex and grid. Um, and so first let's look at what that display flex property does. Flex is a way of getting all the children's el children elements of a tag. So for instance, let's say you had a div here and you had these two tags inside of it and you had a parent element and these children. These gray things, by the way, are comments, and you can just uh, add them in by following this particular syntax with the less than sign, exclamation mark, dash, dash. But I've just written it for your benefit, where you can see that there's like a parent element and then it has two children, right? What flex does is it forces all the children to be in line, whether they like it or not. So it doesn't matter what their default property was, uh, they are going to become in line elements. And what that does is it prevents the stacking, right? So if you had a bunch of H1s and Ps, they were originally display block. But when you do display flex, they get aligned along this, this main axis. So let me just do that to show you proof. And there we go. So now they're aligned on the main axis. By the way, one confusion that people often have is like, when do we use style and when do we use class? Why do you sometimes write stuff inside this like class? And when, why do you sometimes write st stuff in line? It's just like, you can use either, whatever suits you. Yeah, it was more convenient for me to write style here rather than going ahead and making a new class. So that's what I did. So what I've done here is I've made this outer div a flex div. And what you've seen is that these things were originally blocks, but they were forced to be in line. And they occupy the full width of the parent. And they, they're like sharing that main axis space, right? So there are two axes that you need to know of. There's the uh, main axis. And there's the cross axis. And the main axis for a regular like flex box is like always horizontal. And the cross axis is always vertical, right? So what fle display flex does is it makes everything line up along the main axis. Okay. Any questions about this so far? I'm curious about something. If, uh, does doing display in line block, um, be, what my like my first intuition is like why wouldn't you just do everything as display inline block rather than display flex? But would that create the little horizontal scrolly bar rather than create hot, causing them to overflow into the next line? Uh so it depends. Uh, I think inline block does cause the horizontal scrolly bar, which means like overflow basically. With flex, it tries its best to keep everything on one line. 
and, and it, like every element will get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And the only way to get wrap or overflow, like to fix the overflow issue is to like manually add a wrap property, right? Uh, yeah, so there's some difference. Uh, whenever I've had to use these different display properties, I usually only ever work with inline block, flex and grid. There is inline dash block, which is what you're referring to here. Yeah, but I rarely have to use that. There's some nuances here, but uh, yeah. Okay. Awesome. Any other questions? Cool. Okay, so now we've got stuff in a flex container. This thing is called the flex container, the thing which has the flex property set on it. Um, now I mentioned that stuff aligns along the main axis. What if you wanted to align it along the cross axis instead? So you could just set the flex direction. By setting the flex direction to be column, you flip the axes. So the main axis is the vertical one and the cross axis is the horizontal one. Let's just do that here. So, I mean, almost it's in a way as if like we've come back to where we started, right? Now we have a flex container and all the elements are basically forced to be in line, but in the vertical direction. And if you didn't know what the code was, you'd think that they're just block. Right. But crucially though, they're in a flex container and they're forced to be like this. So let's set the flex direction back to what it was. Either we can do it explicitly by saying row, or we can just leave out that property altogether, and that's the default. So that's the flex direction done. Any questions about flex direction? Because after this, we get to the fun stuff. What should I have seen? Uh, you mean here? You just want it to be. Oh, when changing the flex direction, you would have seen the uh, boxes just aligning themselves vertically instead of horizontally. Yeah, so this GIF, um, when, when the flex direction is row, it's all like horizontal. When it's column, it's like the axis gets, axis gets flipped. So now that, now that we have everything inside a flex container, all the children element inside a flex container, we can start doing all the like crazy alignment and justification stuff we want, right? So there are two properties that we need to know. The first one we're gonna look at, it's called justify content, right? What justify content mean? justify content is responsible for everything along the main axis, which by default is the horizontal axis. Let's get back to the regular flex direction. And now we can start justifying stuff. But since the paragraph is so large, uh, we won't really see any cool effects. Um, so what we're gonna do is replace this paragraph with another H1. And maybe let's call this header two. Let's call this header one. Okay, so right now everything's in a flex uh, container and we can start using the justify content property. Right? And that aligns stuff along the main axis. So what kind of values does this have? We can start with center, puts everything in the center. We can start with flex start, but that was basically what it was by default. If there's a flex start, then that means there's this flex end as well. You can space out the elements, so you can do space around. And you can also do space between, which is like space around, but just like gets rid of the stuff on the edges, on the left and the right extremes. So just using a flex container, we're able to align these children with this justify content. Sorry, we're able to justify these children with this justify content property. And we can see it in the GIF as well. These are just a few of the properties. Any questions about justify content?
Okay. So now that we've seen this, let's look at the other. I think it would be useful if we could do a hands raise if anyone's had any trouble so far or have been able to replicate the justify content thing. So can you thumbs up if you've been able to do this? As always, like if you have even like the slightest confusion, then feel free to stop me or like put it in the chat. Yeah. And one thing I can do is just uh, copy the link as it is now and just put it in the chat so that people have the exact code even if they been, haven't been able to catch up entirely. Cool, okay. So now let's go on to align items. And what this does is it aligns stuff in the cross axis. So the main axis is the horizontal one by default and the cross axis by default is the vertical one. So you can align items along the cross axis. Um, so this really depends on um, what the height of the parent container is to begin with. Otherwise it doesn't make any sense to align stuff. So what we're going to do is going to try and visualize what that looks like. Right, so currently you can see that there's this parent container with a particular height. Um, let's actually increase the height a bit. Maybe 200 pixels. Um, sometimes the children will just follow the height of the parent. And that's totally fine. Other times they won't, right? So for instance, if I had put a paragraph in here, now this is a better representation of unequally, uh, unequally distributed elements by height, right? The header and the header two are like sort of in the center, but this paragraph isn't. What if we wanted to force that alignment? So that's where that flex property comes in. So now we go here and by the way, if you're having trouble seeing the screen and you're having to scroll a lot like this, um, you, can, you can press Command Shift P if you're on a Mac or Control Shift P if you're on Windows. And you can just do toggle word wrap. Just wrap the contents so it's easier to work with and you don't have to scroll that much. So Command Shift P, toggle word wrap. Okay. All right, now let's get back to writing the align property. So align item center, right? What this does is it aligns everything again in, I'm just using this tool which helps me illustrate, but it's aligning everything alongside, uh, aligning everything vertically. So the paragraph, the header, etc. everything's aligned. Cool. And then there are a few other properties that were seen in the, the GIF, like align stretch, which in this case doesn't produ produce any meaningful change. Uh, there's align flex start, flex end. Uh, there's align baseline. These are just things that you, you can like play with over time. So align baseline, for instance, just aligns the baseline of all three elements. So they all start at the bottom here. Any questions about a line? Uh, thumbs up if you've been able to do a line as well. Cool. So with that, meaning justify content and align items, we have 100% of like what you need to get productive with Flexbox. This is the most common flex code that you're gonna see. If the parent container doesn't have a width of 100% already, you give it that width. You set it to be flex and you set its children to be space between or center and usually you align their item center as well. For, for me, this is a code I use very often. So often that I just put it into a container class and apply it all over the place. So for what I mean by that is I'll go here, I'll create a container class. I'll 
call it display flex. I'll justify content center maybe or space between. Uh, I'll do align items center. I'll give it a width of 100% just in case. And I'm gonna get rid of all of this code. I'm just gonna give it the container class. And it's same effect. Then here, when I wanna change things, then I just have to change like one or two things like space between for the justify. Any questions so far? Okay. So the big secret of making complex layout with CSS is you just need to nest flex containers. That's pretty much like the rest of the presentation is redundant. This is like the takeaway. Um, you start, you basically work from the outside in to create any interesting configuration of things that you want, any interesting layout that you want. Say that we want we have like three items, this one, which is like one text, piece of text, this one, and this one. But you want them distributed along, along this like horizontal axis in such a way that the first piece of text is way off to the left, the next two are way off to the right, but then even within the next two, they're spread apart within their parent, right? What you can do is you can just use two text containers for that and nest one of them inside the other. So let's go through this code. You start with the outside div or like whatever HTML element. In this case, I have div and you, the, it has this outside class. So it's got a background color, which is red, which is right here. It's a flex container, which means all its children will be aligned within that flex box. And it's got a justify content space between property, right? So all, any of its children will be spaced out as much as possible away from each other. So what are its children? It's got a left and it's got a right. These are its immediate children. So the left one is here, this one, and it gets pushed to the left, and this one gets pushed to the right. And then within the, we can make the right div a flexbox container of its own. And so I've given it a class which makes its background color green, and it's a flex container, and then you can justify its children as space between as well. So right has two children called right inner, two divs with background color blue, and those are spaced apart as well. So we've been able to use just two flex boxes to create this kind of layout. This by the way is how I made the uh, the header for the Slack interface, right? So if we just look through this for a second, um, just this part right here, right? Um, there, there are these traffic lights on the left. There are a bunch of these controls in the middle and there's a question mark sign on the right. So you start with the first flex box. Let me see if I can even pull it up here. You start with the first one um, here and you justify all these elements between, all its children between. And what are its children? The traffic lights to the left, the controls in the middle, and the question mark to the right. So you start with that. But then you realize like, oh, the controls have like three things inside of them. So what do we do about that? So then you open up controls and um, you can make that a flex container as well, basically. Any questions so far? Are we feeling okay so far about flex as a concept? Awesome. Woohoo! Okay. Awesome. Uh, so the question in the chat is, how did you get the icons for the Slack title, like the arrows and the traffic lights? Uh, 
So the arrows is just like a random SVG I picked up. I just Googled for uh, like an arrow icon. That's how I use that. The traffic lights, I actually just made them in CSS. Uh, if you're interested, I can go over that right now. We'll get to it eventually, but um, basically there's, you can abuse CSS in interesting ways to create shapes that you want. Um, yeah, so for instance, you just make an empty div, don't give it any content. And uh, let's just give it a class called like light. And this is, yeah, this is just like going off on a, a bit of a tangent, but like it's cool. Uh, it's a cool way of showing what CSS is capable of. You create like a light class and then uh, you give it like a bit of a fixed width and a height if you like, like maybe 10 pixels, 10 pixels height. You can't see anything yet. So now you give it a background color. You maybe make it red or you figure out what the what it's actually supposed to be. I'm gonna actually take it outside of the flex box because I just want it showing up down here. Here we go. And what you can start doing is uh, just give it this property border radius. And for some reason in CSS, if you give a very large border radius to a small element, the corners just become totally round. So you can make circles this way. Yeah. And you can make you can make three of these if you like. This is good because uh, we can just create some of the, the components as we go. So for the light, we just have like uh, three of these. And I mean, now we see that they're block elements, right? They're just three divs. What's the way to get them all in line? And we, we already know that it's flex. So we can just make this style um, display flex. And now they're next to each other, but they're too close to each other, right? So each light can have a margin right of 10 pixels or maybe five pixels. And now they're further away from each other. Right, you can override the color here. You can make this one uh, background color yellow. It doesn't look that great, but you, be, you, you get what I mean. And then you can do background color green so now you have the traffic lights yeah all right any other questions if you want to learn more about flexbox then uh there's this excellent game online called flexboxfroggy.com and um Basically, you can polish up your, if you know some already, you can polish it up or you can learn it from scratch. It's really nice. Thanks. Okay, now we get to grid and we're gonna cover the bare basics because I'm also learning grid at the moment, um, but there's some really cool things that you can do with it. So Flexbox is a way that you can create layouts by just nesting flex containers. If you get tired of doing that, you can just use grid. You can make stuff like this, like crazy stuff. Uh, you can make stuff like this, which is called the Holy Grail layout, which you saw earlier with Discord, Slack, WhatsApp, things like that. So you have like the sidebar nav, you've got a main content, you might have a third sidebar on the right, you've got a header and a footer. Right, so this is something that we're gonna use for Slack. Can you also recommend games to learn HTML and CSS? Uh, I don't have a game in mind, but I know that, um, what's it called? Open assembly? something assembly oh general assembly um yeah this was something i used and i think it explains it pretty well yeah let me put this in the chat it teaches you all three html css and javascript okay so how do we work with grid uh, oh, there's an excellent resource to learn grid too, which I'm currently going through. Oops, I never put the two links in the everyone. Let me just do that. Uh, so yeah, there's a resource I'm currently using for CSS grid, uh, but I know a little bit that we're gonna use in the Slack design. 
And uh, what it, and the best way to like quickly get started with Grid is to use an interactive tool that creates your Grid for you, and you can just copy the code. So in this case, we're going to go to layoutit.com, and that lets you create your Grid pretty quickly. Um, so you go to the CSS Grid generator, and we start defining the different areas that we want. Right. So we have say like a header area. We can just scroll, drag over it, call it header. Click enter. We have a sidebar. Click enter. A content. Click enter. And once we have this grid, uh, we can just click and get the code. Right? It's right here. We can click that, or we can just copy it from the side. Okay. Now we copy the code that we need, and you can just see it's basically just CSS classes that. They wrote the they wrote the CSS code for you and bundled it inside classes. We can go back to our um, code sandbox. I'm going to delete everything that we've used so far. The flex stuff. We're back to our body and the CSS too. Just like paste in this. You see nothing because only CSS was added, no HTML. Uh, so we go back. And we copy the HTML too. Ooh. Great. Now we've got a grid container when we've got three things inside of it. We still don't see anything because not, not, none of these have any content inside of them as well. Right? So we need to visualize what our grid looks like on the page as we see it. So I'm going to insert some content here header. Let me just call it header actually. Let me call the sidebar area sidebar. Let me call the content area content, or like just the text inside of each element. And you can kind of see that, yeah, it does mimic that grid structure from earlier. We did have something like this. It's not exactly how we want it to be, right? It's not taking up the full page uh, height, for instance. It's just a grid like on the top of the page, this like tiny squeezed little grid. Um, how can we get it looking more like what we expect from a full width, full height app. So let's start visual, like the best way to work with CSS is to attach borders everywhere and to so, sort of see like what each box is doing, what each tag is doing. Let me attach a border to the main grid container uh, and let's make it red, right? Great, we've got that. Uh, let me attach a border to the header or maybe even a background color, same thing in terms of visualization usefulness. Got a header, great. Let's attach a background color to the other ones too. Great. And yeah, it does look a bit like the grid that we made there earlier. Um, but it's not perfect. Uh, we want it to be full height, just like the Slack interface out here, right? We want it to occupy like the full height of our web browser. Why isn't it doing that? Um, and so um, this is where Tailwind's going to come in a bit useful later, but there's some default properties that we need to change. So uh, there's the body, the HTML. Uh, by default, they don't let their children occupy 100% of the height, of their height. So you need to force first the body and the HTML to be full height so that their children can also be full height. Uh, that might sound a bit confusing, but uh, sadly, that's just the way it is when you're just working with plain like CSS HTML. You set your body in HTML to be full height. And then you set all their children elements, in this case, the grid, to be full height as well. So in this case, I'm going to let this be full height. Right? And yeah, there we go. So the header, the sidebar, the content, they occupy the full height of your web page now. And we sort of are getting close, right? We're sort of seeing that, oh, like this might just be the beginnings of like something like Slack. Yeah. Any questions so far? By the way, on lines 10, 11, I did a bit of a shorthand. Uh, instead of writing out body and HTML separately, like I could have just done this. Same thing. 
hundred percent. Right. But sometimes if you like, don't want to repeat yourself too much, just like separate stuff with a comma and that's cool. Any questions? Okay, let's keep going. So we've got our grid and we've got our header, header, sidebar and content. And if you look back, you'll see that um, it is doing what we asked it to do. There are four columns and there are three rows, right? And the header is taking up one third as it should be. And it's taking up four columns as it should be. But one of the things about responsive design is that a header, for instance, doesn't need all that space. Uh, it could do without. So it could do without all of the vertical space. And one way to force it to just like take up as much as its space as it needs, as it needs, is to go to Google and see how can I make a grid column, a grid row, take up as much space as it needs. And it turns out that the way to do it is to replace this unit, which is one fraction, with auto, which means just like take up as much space as you need. So the first row out of the three, this is the first row, the header row, I'm just gonna set it to be auto. And it's only gonna now take up this as much space as it needs, right? So even if I make a multi-line thing here, yeah, that's only the amount of stuff that it needs now, but not more than that. Okay, and same goes for the sidebar, right? Like, yeah, the sidebar typically needs a bit of space for like all the channels that we're gonna put for the Slack and like all the users, basically all of this stuff out here. But why don't we just let the browser decide, right? Why, why, do we, why should we hard code any kind of width uh, to be like one fraction? Let's just let the browser decide. So we're gonna go back here and our first column is going to be uh, set to auto as well in this case, right? Now that we have this, yes, I mean, the, the sidebar does look too small now. Um, so maybe there's some minimum that it shouldn't be less than, but besides that, it should just take as much space as it needs to, right? So there's actually a property called min, min width, min height, stuff like that. So min width, I, I maybe like 200 pixels, right? So it'll never get any, any smaller than this. Okay. But otherwise it'll take up as much space as it needs. What questions do you have? Cool. Yeah, I think we I think we can actually uh, I don't know if, if people want it slower, but I, I think the pace is pretty good. We can if you want you can go probably a little bit faster. Okay. Sounds good. Cool. So now we've covered grid and we've got like the skeleton of our of our Slack app. Uh, now we're gonna look at this really cool library which is gonna save you tons and tons of time. It's called Tailwind CSS. Let's go explore its website. A utility first CSS framework for rapidly building custom designs. Like 99% of that was just jargon and we don't need to be concerned with it. Uh, all we just need to do is click install or find the install button. Maybe you can just do, yeah, get started. Scroll down all the way and just copy this link. Like copy this HTML tag, sorry. I'll put it in the chat as well. And you go back to your um, HTML and anywhere in your head, like anywhere, maybe even after the end of the style tag that we put, just like paste it in there, okay? And 
the moment you click save right off the bat you'll see some weird stuff happen right your grid changed a bit one the text got a bit nicer it switched it to a sans by default um the other thing that happened was that some of these weird white space things went away as well so i didn't tell you this but html body they have default white space on their own so they have like padding and margin of their own and sometimes it's a big pain to just like have to start a new project and just like reset all those properties to like zero so what tailwind does is it resets that stuff for you automatically if you've ever used bootstrap and things like that then it's quite similar but where tailwind's different from bootstrap is that it's non-prescriptive it doesn't provide any sort of default stuff besides this it has no cards it has no nav bar no footer uh like no jumbotron or anything no components basically and the only thing it provides you is these things called utility classes so you know how i've been writing stuff like grid container header sidebar earlier i had something called sarm these are all classes right and what tailwind does is it recognizes that people would just prefer to write everything in line like with within style but writing the whole thing can be pretty wordy right stuff like this writing that can be pretty wordy uh so how do you minimize that so what it does is it gives you a bunch of convenience classes that you can pepper in your code so for instance if i wanted to make my header text color to be like red i could just do text red and maybe like 800 which is the strength of the color and it'll be there right so these are basically this class i didn't write it anywhere it's nowhere in my code but tailwind provided it for me right and that's like super convenient because now i don't have to be busy writing classes all over the place they're just standard classes that i can pepper in everywhere it's not just like text color there are a bunch of cool things you can do as well so padding right uh instead of writing this padding bottom 20 pixels right you just use their pre-built stuff so you go back here you do uh py or pb sorry p means padding b means bottom and then you do dash and then you do like four for instance and it'll do it for you so four is just some random unit like four rem or whatever unit they use you can go up to like 16 32 yeah there are a bunch of there are a bunch of them your code but i think it's just been super fast uh any questions about tailwind and i would also appreciate if people could give me a thumbs up if they've been able to install tailwind by including this tag awesome okay uh let's keep going Cool, now we've got Tailwind, we've got all the basic building blocks, and now we can just spend time recreating Slack, right? I'm gonna try my best to walk you through some of the stuff I've done already. And for me, it'll also be like recreating it all over again. So I'll be making mistakes as well and learning along with you. So we won't be able to make it interactive. We won't be able to have like cool effects like hovering. It won't be responsive like for a phone, it won't have fancy animations. That's the first disclaimer. The second one is that you don't usually go straight into like web design. Uh, you first start with a design, uh, which is built in Photoshop, XD, Figma, things like that. So you get a designer to mock up stuff for you, and then you do this. But this is purely a learning exercise, so we're going to do it anyway. And we follow the same principles that I've been mentioning so far. You start working from the outside in, and I'll explain a bit what that means. You use grid for the main areas, which we've done already. So like the header, the sidebar, and the content. And you just need to be worried a bit about like what each section will be look like, what each section will look like. Okay. So let's take a look at Slack again and let's start thinking about like what sections it might have. So let's see. The very first one, the header, which we have, right? Uh, there are actually two sidebars, right? Which wasn't in our initial grid code. So there's one here, which is called the workspace chooser, right? There's another one here, which is your channel information. And then you get your basic content area, which is this.
right? So, I mean, there are other ways to div this up, right? You can make arbitrary like divisions and just nest stuff. So I could say that there are actually two things here. There's here, there's one here, and there's one here. So we could have a grid that's made of five things. Right? Typically though, you want to create you want to keep your outside grid, like your basic like um, container to be simple. And then you can start nesting stuff inside of it. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna make a grid with four things in it. So let's go back to layout it. Right? Let's just make content yay big and let's make this the sidebar or we can call it anything we want so maybe i can just call it details right um does it make sense that content needs uh two columns no it doesn't um we're gonna use the auto property to make these just take up as much space as it needs to and content will occupy the rest. So the fact that content is represented here with two columns is purely for visual purposes. Uh, we can actually just get rid of this extra column. There we go. Similarly, does it make sense that sidebar details and content need two rows to themselves? No, it doesn't. It looks right, but it's purely for visual purposes, right? So we can just get rid of this bottom row here. Now this might look a weird, bit like freaky that you've got like a header and sidebar which are essentially the same height and sidebar details and content are essentially the same width but it doesn't matter because we can just fix it later uh, when we're sizing each element okay so i'm going to click get the code and i'm going to copy this go back cool and Great, we have this. Let me just add the background colors back. Oh, let's just use Tailwind to do it, right? Because it's so much faster. We go back here and let me copy all the code first, including the HTML. Okay, so now we have all of them. We can't see anything because it doesn't have any text inside of it. So let's just put in all the text. Cool. We're starting to get the beginnings of stuff. Uh, we just need to set the grid container to be 100% height. Cool. Now it looks a lot like what layout it told us it would look like, which is perfectly fine, but we fix it. Um, now let's just use Tailwind to um, start adding in the colors. What are these numbers, 400, 300? They're just like shades. So they, they go from 100 to 800. 800 is the most like vibrant shade, like very dark. And uh, you get more pastel colors as you go down the numbers. I set this one to be a red as well, but I can just make it green and so on and so forth. You get the idea. There's indigo, just a bunch of colors out there. Okay, so now we've got our grid here. Um, and now we just need to fix the sizing. So uh, we go our, to our columns. We know that the sidebar and the details need only take up like as much space as they need. So we set them both to auto. So they're shrunk down, content's taking up most of the space. We go to our rows and we take the first row to take up as much space as it needs, but not more. Great, so now we've got a grid that looks a lot like what you're gonna be, what like basically Slack looks like. This is what, is the bare bones skeleton behind something like Slack? Yeah. What questions do you have? So when you're prototyping, use Tailwind. It's really fast, it's really productive. You can clean up the messy code later. It's just important to get something up and running. Um, and this is very typical that you figure out, you see a CSS issue and you fix it with some more CSS by just adding in a class. 
right? You, it's very iterative, iterative. You go back and forth and you keep adding chain things, you keep adjusting things until you see something that you like, right? So for instance, like this sidebar, I'm not totally happy with that because uh, like last time, I want to give it a min width. So I'll go back here and I'll do that. And it's up to you. You can use Tailwind if you want or you, you don't use it. That's also totally fine. Same for the details. Maybe I want to give it a min width of like at least 100 pixels. Yeah. Maybe the sidebar could be less. Maybe it could be more. Maybe the header could be more and so on and so forth. You just keep playing around. Uh, this is not related to the Slack interface per se. You might notice that this part is adjustable. That's really cool. CSS lets you do this kind of stuff as well. Um, so I can just go over how to do that. Um, go to your, the thing that you want to adjust, in this case, the details, which you want to be adjustable, the second sidebar. And you can put in two things, which look a bit like magic, but um, just by Googling around, you can figure out what they are. So you do overflow auto and you do resize vertical. And suddenly you've got like a resizable, oop, resize horizontal. And suddenly you've got a resizable pane. Yeah, does that sound good? Cool. Okay, now, Basically, I've covered all the concepts that I wanted to cover. And at this point, I'm just gonna be going over uh, how we can start recreating some of this stuff. Um, and yeah, so let's keep going and see how far we make it. Yeah, go for it, just, just do it. <laughs> yeah, let's start with a header. So first thing we need to know is like, ooh, what's the header's color, right? I'm gonna use this thing called color slurp. And it's basically just a way, I don't think you can see it on my screen, but it's a color picker basically. And I'm gonna uh, pick that color, which I see on my slides. One second. It needs weird permissions, which I'm just gonna give it. There we go. So first uh, we go back and the header, it needs to be, it needs to look like a bit of that purple color. I'm just gonna remove the stuff here and specify my own color. I'm gonna do it here in the header, background color. And yeah, just this hex code. And it looks like that like nice, like purplish color that we wanted, right? But the other thing is that now all the text is black. So how do we see it? So I'm just gonna set the text color to be white. Great, so now we've got the text color to be white. I'm gonna add some padding. I'm choosing to do it in Tailwind because I find it more like, easier and like less code. I'm gonna add padding. Uh, such that maybe like PY is four, which means along the vertical axis, uh, or maybe two works better, and PX maybe one, right? So now it looks a bit, it seems to have more space around it, which is great. Great, now that we've got the header, we're gonna start with the traffic lights. So I'm gonna create a new div to hold all my traffic lights. I'm gonna make three divs underneath, right? And for each of these, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna make a class temporarily which is for light, same thing I did before, and border radius, um, 1,000 pixels, um, width, maybe seven pixels, height, so seven pixels, and I can just attach it here. Cool. And what I'm gonna do next is uh, give it, make this flex as well. Uh, I think I'm gonna add a width through Tailwind as well. 
interesting. Uh, funny that it doesn't show. Let's keep let's keep debugging and like looking at it. It might be a bit too tall. So a bit sorry, not tall enough. Oh, of course, we need to give it a background color as well. So let's just do it here, actually. So the first one's red. The second one is uh, yellow. And the third one is green. OK. And let me just put the padding back to what it was before. Let me get rid of these Ds in the middle. Let me add margins for each of these. So you kind of see now I've got my traffic lights. Are they perfect? No, but usually that's what you need to start off with, right? You can increase the width and the height of each light as well and probably start looking a bit closer to what you, what you want it to be. Um, but yeah, I think that looks pretty good for the traffic lights. Uh, we'll keep moving. So now we, what we need is something in the center for the controls and something on the right for your question mark. Um, so how do you get the thing that we need in the center for the controls? Uh, we can, we already have our like um, traffic lights here, which I'll, I'll just give them an ID, which is another property just to make stuff clearer for me where I am. Alternatively, I can just write a comment. What I need is some sort of parent container to like flex everything and distribute everything uh, horizontally. And I can just do that right here. Cool. Inside of this, I can place my traffic lights. Nothing changed so far. Now that we've created a parent container, we know that all these children will be distributed evenly alongside the horizontal axis. We've got our traffic lights already, they're on the left. We can start adding in more stuff as the direct children of the parent container. So in this case, an input, like search bar, right? So we just need an input here. It can have a placeholder with like search this workspace or something like that. Uh, yeah, there we go. It's right there. So it's this workspace. Uh, we can style it as well. So we can give it tailwind classes like rounded, which rounds the edges a bit. Uh, and we can give it some padding so that the text doesn't completely hug the edges. There we go. And we're doing well. Notice now that the traffic lights are not centrally aligned with the search bar. So how do we do that? We go back, to, we hop up the tree to the parent container, which holds both of them. And then we just align them centrally, right? And sorry, not align center, but in Tailwind, it's called item center. There we go. So now they're aligned centrally alongside, along the uh, cross axis. But now we need a question mark to the right and we want the uh, search bar to come to the center. How do we do that? We create a new uh, element for the question mark. Just by virtue of creating this element, we know that there's a, they're in a flex container with three things inside, so they'll all be spaced evenly anyway. So the input will automatically come to the center. We don't need to worry about that. So here, I can just put in my um, question mark sign here. And there we go. Right? This question mark doesn't look the same as it did when I showed you my Slack interface from earlier. It doesn't look like this. How can we get it to look pretty? How can you get the input to look pretty? Those are all valid questions. So um, we go back to the question mark and we start attaching cl tailwind classes to it as well. And there are a bunch, and I only know these because I memorized, but stuff like bo border, right? Um, just like border, black, maybe, uh, things like that. Sometimes it might be better to just make a class for things when you don't know the tailwind classes. So I could make a question mark class. Go back here. 
and maybe give it some padding, maybe five pixels, add a border, one pixel solid white, and a border radius, maybe thousand pixels. And suddenly, like now we have that, or we have some version of that. Yeah. So now we've got pretty much like the header sort of like complete. We've got all that we needed. We've got the basic controls. And now it's just like continuing to refine until you get something that looks pretty close to the original. Right? So for instance, what did I do with the placeholder? I don't remember. I just looked up stuff until I found something that works. So if I go to the Slack interface and maybe open up my old sandbox, there were a bunch of uh, classes that I used. Um, so let me do that. We actually have it here. So if I just search for the input in my original. Uh, yeah, this is all the stuff I use for it. Uh, a bunch of styles. Like I said, the width, uh, it's the alignment of the text, what the background color would be, what the border should be, things like that. Uh, and yeah, it started looking pretty good. Even if you just copy the tailwind classes from here and just apply them, you'll start seeing that it like, looks pretty similar to like what Slack actually looks like. Uh, so for instance, if I went to this and just like copied some of pasted some of the classes, yeah, you get to see that it looks a bit smaller, it looks a bit refined, the text is a bit better, and you can start playing around with the other things like the background color and things like that for that input. Yeah. Awesome. Any questions? Cool, let's keep going. Uh, let's try to make more and more pieces of this. Let's start with the sidebar. Uh, now, this sidebar is just the workspace switcher, and that's this thing right here, where it's got like a bunch of workspaces that you're a part of, um, and this plus icon in the bottom, so you can add new ones. And that's pretty easy to do as well. You, you go back, and this is where like a flex box with column direction would be really useful, right? So we could, make the sidebar a flex, right? And we could have the flex direction to be column. Now, I don't totally recall like what the syntax is for doing in Tailwind, so I can just look it up. Right, so it just says flex direction column, flex call is what you can use uh, to basically write the same CSS. So I'm gonna do it here. Cool, and then I can start adding in my icons for workspaces. So one, let me just add in three. And maybe one, maybe two, maybe three. Here we go. That looks pretty close. Uh, all we need to do is just give it some styles. So we can make it rounded, full. Can we give it a padding, maybe four. We can give it a background color, maybe red. Um, we make sure that it has a fixed width, right? Or maybe more than that, um, a bit more. Uh, and then we keep going, uh, keep adjusting as we see fit. We do this for all three, right? Then we add some margins to each of the bottoms. Don't need it for the last one. We can add some top margin as well for the first one. So it like has a bit of room to breathe. Right. And now we know that the sidebar, yeah, it's a bit too big for this, right? Uh, this workspace switcher. So the thing that we wrote earlier, the min width, we can just take that out. We know that we won't need it. And we can just start like giving more room to each of these so that they're not perfectly like hugged up, hugged up against the edges. So um, we go back to the sidebar and maybe just give it some padding right here on the parent. Great, so now they have more room. And so you can already start to see that this starts looking a lot like this. And it's just a matter of like continued refining 
of things. And the same goes for this uh, sort of information about the channel and the same goes for the content area. And it's just like you keep going, you keep chipping away at it until it gets in a place where you like. Yeah. Antonio, what do you think? Should we keep going or uh, I mean, I'm happy to keep going and basically build. Yeah, up I think I think for the people who stayed on here, unless uh, people are are like dying to get off, um, if, if you're able to summarize, I'd, I'd say we go till eight, and then um, we'll send the recording along of what we got so far to everybody, and everyone has the source code. So I, I'd say, uh, personally, I'd love to see you fly through it and see if you can do it in the next twenty minutes. Uh, I'd, perfect, I'd perfect. And I, uh, I'm big. People have objections. I mean, they'll have the video so they can play back slower later. <laughs> sure. Sure. Yeah, uh, I'm happy uh, to give it a try and try and see yeah, if we can get through let's, let's see you go on a hyperdrive. I want to see full time. <laughs> what usually happens is when I start writing code fast, I mess up more. Um, but I'll, I'll try my it'll, best. Yeah. It'll look like a better it'll, slack. <laughs> uh, yeah, so in this case, we want to get these looking a bit better. Uh, the background color, let's change that, for instance. That's like an easy win. So, how do we do that? We go into color slurp. So that's the tool I'm using. You probably can't see it on the screen. But I'm just copying the text the color. And let me go to the sidebar. And let me just put it in here. Kelvin doesn't have support for exact colors. So if you want an exact color, you have to write it yourself within the within the actual CSS code and not as part of the utility classes. Once we have this, we can just remove the original sidebar color, which was put by Tailwind. Cool. Doesn't look super realistic uh, yet because of these weird gaps between each part of the grid. And that was because those gaps came from here uh, when we copied our code from layout.com. So we can get rid of those two. Now all those gaps are gone. That looks better. Um, You'll notice that for the workspace switcher, we had these icons which looked a bit squarer and they're rounder and the text inside of them, we've got a border. So let's do that now. <clears throat> so instead of one, I'm just gonna have MB, the SA, just some random letters for what your workspace name is. And yeah, they're kind of not great. They're spilling over because they don't have enough room. So we can just remove this like width that we put in on before, just let them have enough room that they need. And it's a lot better already. Uh, text maybe isn't as big, as good as we would like. Like it's a bit too small maybe. So we want it bigger. And Kelvin provides utility classes to do this as well. So uh, I think there are a bunch. There's like text large, I think. Yeah. So MB is a bit bigger than SA, you can see. Uh, text large here. And I am repeating myself here. So what I'm doing is I'm like copying the stuff more and more. And if I don't want to do that, then I just like put it in the parent. So I know, if, for instance, that this, this workspace switcher is only going to have text, which is ever going to be this large, like text large size. So I just put it on the parent and then get rid of stuff here. And that's like inheritance in action again. So that's just one way I can re stop repeating myself. And the last thing that I need is like a border around these guys so that they look more like Slack, this like border. Um, let me do that. Mm, I, would, I would prefer to write the border syntax myself because it's a bit easier. So uh, workspace border, border maybe two pixels solid and white. There's some properties though that you just have to copy paste in for each element. For, for example, the border, it wouldn't make any sense to put it on the parent. Like if you put the border here, it actually just color the border of the parent, not the children. So there's some properties that cascade down or that inherit downwards. And there's some properties that just apply to the current box. Um, so in this case, it doesn't really make sense to do it. Yeah. Uh, Icons maybe look a little bigger, but I think we'll leave the workspace switcher for now and move on to 
the other things. I mean, I could keep uh, modifying this a bit uh, to make it look just right, but uh, I think it looks good now. And let's keep going. So now that we've done the, um, we've done the sidebar, we can just minimize that code. We don't need it anymore. Same goes for the header. You can just minimize that code. Uh, and now let's go into the details. And by the way, the order that layout it gives you for the divs has no consequence on the actual grid. I could just bring this details up here and it would be the same. Nothing changed because the ordering is determined by this CSS code right here for the grid container. It's not dependent on anything else. Okay. Also, anyone who's still on the call, feel free to like interrupt at any point, like put in a question in the chat. How do you do that? Okay, let's go back. So now uh, there's basically some details about the uh, current workspace that we're in. So let's do that. I'm gonna use an H1. Tailwind actually strips all H's of their sizing. So it doesn't matter if you use an H1, H2, H3, it's all reset. You have to set the text size manually. I'm just gonna use H1. That's interesting. I'm gonna use H2. What's up? It's interesting. Uh, I wouldn't. Yeah, I mean, uh, some would argue that it's like bad that Tailwind does this, like that it just removes all default styling from everything. Um, but I mean, the purpose of HTML, I think they put it well that the purpose of HTML is purely semantic. So it's mm -hmm. to help people with accessibility issues, like screen readers, to uh, yeah. basically like know the structure of the page, and the styling is up to the designer. And so they reset everything. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, so for the details, I'm gonna give it a padding as well. So it has some room. Um, we're getting close. Um, yeah, see CSS workshop, maybe text white as well here. And let's go back and give it that background color. And And it's still not changed because we haven't removed the Tailwind's background. Great. Awesome. So now we've got two divs and they look fairly similar to what's in the actual interface. Um, what we need is maybe a bottom border uh, so that we can create a separation between the channels that are coming up next. So I'm gonna do that now. I'm gonna give it a Actually, the way I'll do it is by creating a container div. So I'm gonna make a div with just this text. And maybe we can call this like channel details. So you can use divs to just basically like create components out of your code. Uh, and then below this, we'll have like all the other things like channel list, right? So for the channel details, I'll give it the bottom border, right? Maybe I'll just do it in line with my own style. maybe black and unfortunately now like I've run into a problem and what's the problem? The problem is that I put padding um, inside the, um, basically I put padding on the parent. And so the border doesn't actually belong here. It belongs like on some place that doesn't have par a parent in it. Um, as in the padding of the parent is affecting its children such that Putting a border creates this weird spacing out here. So I, I wanna avoid that. And how do I do that? I just like rework things a little bit and I like think about how to do it differently. Um, so instead of having the padding be on the parent, I just like put the padding on the child. There we go. And so now your border is like full width here. Yeah. And we can change the border color so it matches like the other borders as well. Uh, you can see there's like a tiny border here. This by the way is just a figment. It's because like there are these two divs 
that border is not real. So let's make that border real as well. Uh, so if you go to this sidebar and just give it a style. Now we have the border there and we have the border here. So yeah, we made those borders explicit. In the header, we can do it too. The code I'm writing right now is probably quite different from the code I wrote in the finished sandbox on the final slide of the presentation. Uh, and that's because, yeah, every time you figure out, you see a way to do stuff differently and you do it that way. Um, cool, so now everything has a border. The header has a border, this workspace switcher has a border, and your details area has a border. Let's keep going. Uh, what else can we do? The text doesn't look entirely as close to what it looks like for Slack, but that's because it's of a different size. Just by changing the size, it'll start looking a bit more professional. So that's small text, and this is extra small text. Looks a bit better now. And you can change its color too, so it, it doesn't look as like blown out white. You can maybe change it to text gray, like 800 or something. You don't have to though. Uh, yeah, I think it's fine the way it is. Cool, let's keep going. Now we just need the list of like channels. So we come out here, we make a new div and we call it channels. And we maybe just create a list with a UL tag. You don't have to do that. You can just keep creating more divs. Maybe a list is semantically correct, good for screen readers, maybe general here. Finance here, tech here. Getting close. Now maybe um, we need space for each, we need like room for these guys to breathe and not hug the edges. Maybe let's just make a parent tag, put this stuff inside, give it space. Looks pretty close. You can mess around with the text sizing, things like that. All right, let's keep going. Now let's finally hit the content area. Uh, let's start by removing this green color. Let's replace it with what my color picker tells me to replace it with, uh, which is this color here. Cool. And let's go back to content and force all text to be white. Let's give it some room. Maybe P2. Okay. Um, we need information about the channels, like general, how many people they're a part of, and like just stuff like that. So let's go back. Let me call this channel deets, the name of the channel. The, uh, all the stuff underneath, which was the stuff. So that looks pretty similar too. Uh, we can adjust the text sizing for each, so it looks a bit better. Again, small and uh, extra small is what I chose. And all of these are available on Tailwind's website as well. Yeah, looks pretty similar. Uh, add a border, bottom border to this guy. Yeah, still we have like some padding problems and that's because same situation, padding was on the parent, not on the child. So we can just fix that. And yeah, my code does look really messy, but it's getting like somewhere. There's like a mix of inline styles everywhere. There's like weird tailwind classes interspersed in. I've written some style that's up here, but I mean, it's what it takes and you can fix it up later. Yeah. Uh, in my interface, I had like all these borders aligned really neatly, but that was because I was being consistent in the padding and the margins I was using. And here I wasn't. So it's sadly not aligned, but you can you can fix that by just like changing stuff, stuff around. So if I went to see CSS workshop and 
I see here that's like padding four. Maybe I'll try and change it to padding two. Let's see what happens. And it's sort of getting more aligned there. Yeah. But as long as you use, I mean, one good rule of thumb to follow is just use multiples of two, for instance, instead of using three, four, five, and then stuff will generally start to align. Yeah. Okay, let's keep going. Now, we, what we have left is basically these messages. Uh, not sure if we can get it done in five minutes, but it'll get uh, give us a chance to explore some really cool like properties uh, for dealing with images in general. Okay, and we're going to get to use the cat again, which is great. So for each message, we basically need to use a flex container again. So I'm going to go away from the channel details area and create a new area to hold my messages. Okay, and with that, within that, let's start our first message. We can just copy it again later to make our second one. Okay, um, what, what do we need for the message? We basically need, um, we need our image on the left and we need, we need our text on the right. So we're gonna use a flex with same stuff like justify. Uh, it doesn't need to be like a justified along the main axis anywhere. It just, if anything, it just need to be, needs to be justified like aligned on the vertical axis baseline. And inside, we're gonna just have an image and we're gonna have uh, maybe an H1. So the H1 is gonna be the title of the person who posted it. And the image is gonna be the cat itself. And where did the cat come from? It's from here. Cool, but the cat's way too big. So we need to set a width, maybe W2. Now it's way too small, so we make it bigger. That looks goodish, maybe bigger. Okay, that seems okay. Uh, now, we wanted it to be a square image and not like preserve this weird aspect ratio so that any profile picture works because we don't know like what people are gonna be uploading. Um, could be a cat image, which is like a rectangle. It could also be like a weird portrait image. So we want all images to render consistently. So we can set a height, force a height as well. Unfortunately, what that does is it makes this cat stretch in a weird way. It is a square now, but it stretches in a weird way. There's luckily another CSS property we can use called object cover. And that makes it just like fill up the square. And that makes images render really nicely. And we can get like a subtle border, a, a subtle rounded corner on it. That's great as well. Object and, cover is a tailwind uh, property, uh, right? It's a, you, yeah, so this is a tailwind property, but you could do it in line as well. Yeah, so you yeah. could do style uh, object fit cover. There nice. we go, same thing, yeah. And actually items baseline was the wrong idea. It's just fine to have it as it is. That's much better. Uh, and let's actually give the message like a ton of space, a ton of like padding from the edges. Uh, maybe even like eight, that's much better. And then the, the name of the, the cat can just be like, it can have like either a padding or a margin, of like two from the left, that's also good. Uh, we don't just have an H1 though, we have like a bunch of things. So we've got an H1 with the name of the person who wrote the message, but we've also got a, maybe like a span of uh, the timestamps, so like 1.56 p.m. this was sent, right? But we don't want, again, we don't want like this to be a block element on its own line, uh, forced to be so because of H1 being a block element. So there are two ways, either we could use flex again, or we could just set it to be display block, uh, display in line, sorry. Right, great. And set the text size. Awesome. And maybe make this bold, amazing. And now we can write the text, the message itself. Amazing, and we can make this smaller too. Awesome, and we can keep going. So we can now copy this text. Ah, it won't let me scroll any further. But I can try and my guess. Oh, there we go. 
So we kick, copy our message and we figure out where it ends, which is here, and we make another message. Great, and we've got another message. Uh, so awesome. yeah, I mean, co yeah, copying stuff isn't great, but uh, there, that's where you typically go away from just writing everything in a single file. Maybe use something like a JavaScript framework, make components out of things, just like prevent yourself from like reusing stuff uh, too much. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Tom, this is fantastic. Thank, uh, thank you so much. This is, this is an absolutely great workshop. Nick, thank you. Uh, Thanks very much. Definitely jam packed, but I think people learned a lot. I definitely learned a lot. I've never used Tailwind before. I'm more, I, I definitely use Bootstrap more. Uh, and I see a lot of similarities, but I, I can also see the appeal of, of Tailwind. So yeah, this is absolutely yeah. uh, And thank you to everybody who, who stayed all the way to the end. Ellie and Ellen both said uh, thank you that you're awesome. Fantastic. Thank you um, very much. Thank you. Awesome. Ash and I bet is asleep, but it's okay. Uh, <laughs> I'll send the the recording of the the whole workshop along to everybody as, as well as the slides and stuff like that and um any any extra feel free to reply directly to that email with any extra links and stuff that you want to share i know people share a ton of great stuff in the <clears throat> in the chat yeah so thanks thanks for a great workshop Sam. this is fantastic no thank you yeah i hope it wasn't super confusing but uh, no, no, it's just it's a matter of practice wonderful and people can watch it 20 times if they want Great. Awesome. Thank, yeah. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you to everybody who participated. All right. Have a great. Uh, thank you, everyone. Right, thank you. Bye bye. Yeah, Thanks so much, man. No problem. Ashlyn.